worship today. It's been a great time just to celebrate the Lord. And this really is a special day for all of us as this is Palm Sunday. It's the day that we celebrate Christ entering into Jerusalem on that week prior to going to the cross of Calvary. And you know, as we commemorate this day, I was wondering, how is this day celebrated all around the world? And I looked up just a few of the traditions that are still observed today. For example, in Israel, they... Uh, they weave together palm fronds into the shape of crosses and, and give them out. I saw in the areas around India, they, they scatter flowers all down the aisles of the churches as the members are coming into the service. I saw in Poland, though, that one that was a little bit more unique. They build artificial trees out in the, the park area and to see who can build the tallest palm trees as a celebration of Palm Sunday. There's a lot of different ways that we could celebrate this day, but what I want us to understand today is what is the depth of meaning that's found in this day, but not only in Palm Sunday, in all the days that follow that lead up to Easter. And so in the context of our story that we've been walking through, we know that we began all the way back at the beginning in Genesis, where sin entered into the story. God created mankind, and He created us with a unique opportunity to have a relationship with our Creator. But in creation, even then, sin entered the picture. And as sin entered the picture, it broke that, that relationship. But what's amazing as we look at God's story as a whole, that even all the way back in eternity, at that point of creation even, He had a plan of redeeming us. And so as we arrive now at the New Testament story, as we arrive at this Palm Sunday, we see this story beginning to unfold. God's plan of redeeming His people. And so as he came into the town that day, you know, there were many that still were wondering, what is he going to do? Who is this Jesus fellow? I think there were those that were still looking for some kind of upheaval, some uprising that would overthrow that government. Surely he's going to be a king. And so they sang out, you'll remember, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They were singing praise, but I think even in that statement of praise, there still was a hint of confusion. What was this all about? You know, Jesus didn't hide his purpose. He didn't hide why he was coming. In fact, everything that he said pointed to one thing, the fact that he would give his life on a cross to die for our sins. And so today, I want us to look at just several of the things under the picture of broken. You heard in that song, broken and poured out. Well, how is the broken aspects of this story, how do they point to the cross of Christ? And the first one that we see is this, the broken bread is word pictured by the symbolic supper. I want to invite you to turn to Mark chapter 14 in your Bibles. We could look at any of the Gospels for the story, but I want us to look at Mark 14, and we'll begin in verse 16 as we look at this story of the broken bread. Mark 14, 16, it says, So his disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as he had said to them. And they prepared the Passover. In verse 22, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You know, as the disciples prepared that Passover event there, it says in verse 16 that everything was just as he had said. Everything was just as he had told them. You know, that wasn't just relating to that Passover event. In fact, everything leading up to this point was exactly as he told them. Everything that he had laid out in his ministry pointed them to this moment to understand that he would have to die, that he would have to suffer, in order that even these disciples, that we might have life. You know, as they, he told them to go and prepare that Passover event, in their mind, they still had a historical event in mind. They pictured the Passover that celebrated what took place in Egypt. As the slaves were set free, that final event where the blood was to be placed on the doorpost to picture the shedding of blood for the remission of sins, the angel would come over and it would see that blood and it literally would pass over that home and they would be spared, they would have life. 
And so as the disciples gathered that day in the upper room to celebrate Passover, they had that historical context in mind. We're just here to celebrate that Passover event. Well, Jesus was going to give them a much deeper meaning in this. That it wasn't pointing to the Passover in the past, but a Passover that was about to come in the shedding of his own blood. And so as they gathered there for that communion, that Lord's Supper, the depth of meaning found in it was so much greater as Jesus Christ was literally pointing to himself. You know, as he broke the bread that evening, he was pointing to his sacrifice. But again and again, even though Jesus Christ was right there in front of them, they kept missing the picture. Our daughter was telling us about a time when the coach at the school came to her classroom, and he walked in and he said, uh, is Alexis in here? And he's looking all around the room, trying to see where Alexis was. You know where she was? Standing right there in front of him. <laughs> he's a pretty tall fellow, and... She obviously being shorter was looking right over her head. You know, so many times when the message is right in front of us, we look right over the top and miss the message. And the disciples, they had walked with Jesus. You'd say, surely they got it. Surely they know what this is all about. And yet the message that was right in front of them, they were looking right past it. And yet Jesus broke the bread that day in order to point them to the sacrifice that would take place. You know, as he did just that, what's important is to understand is that he was pointing to a new meaning in the Passover. And so what was he teaching there? Well, he said literally, this is my body. You know, I think if we're going to observe ordinances like this, that we need to understand, well, how do we observe it? What's the meaning found in this? I think it's important to understand that as Jesus stood there breaking that bread, he said, this is my body, and then he took the cup and said, this is my blood. He was standing there physically with them, pointing to something that symbolized the body that would be broken. You know, I think the same reality that was present that day is the same truth today. Just as Jesus was physically present, showing a symbol that would help us to understand what was to take place with Christ, the same is true today. It's a symbol of Christ's body broken. And so as we observe the Lord's Supper, which we'll do on this coming Friday in our Good Friday service, we do it because we realize this is a symbolic act that points to the breaking of, of Christ's body and His blood shed so that we might have life. There was a depth of meaning there. You know, it's the same as Jesus saying, I am the door, I am the gate. Did the disciples then think, well, Jesus just became a door. He is now a gate. No, they understood. This was a physical image to show them a spiritual reality. And that's what takes place in the Lord's Supper. You know, as we observe the Lord's Supper, I think there's several reasons why we ought to do that. First of all, Jesus commanded us to do that. He commanded us to do this in remembrance of Him. But you know, I don't think He wants us just to observe events like the Lord's Supper just to say, I checked that off. I fulfilled a command. No, I think we do it second of all because we understand the depth of meaning found in the Lord's Supper. And so as I observe an event like that, I say I am observing this because I understand what Christ has done for me and I worship Him and I do this in remembrance of Him. Listen to what John MacArthur said in relation to the meaning found in the Lord's Supper. He said this, To the Hebrew mind, the concept of remembering meant more than just simply recalling something that happened in the past. It meant recapturing as much as possible the reality and the significance of a person or situation in one's conscious mind. In other words, it's reliving it. So as we observe events like the Lord's Supper, as we come together in worship, we are saying, I'm going to relive the reality of who Christ is and what He has done for each and every one of us. When I participate in an event like that, I relive that moment. Just as I was there with those disciples in the upper room, I get to participate in a rather meaningful event. And so what pointed to what Christ was going to do? Well, first of all, it was the broken bread. That as he broke bread that day, it pointed to the cross that would take place at Calvary. But you know, what also we see, I think, points to the cross is the broken word. That's the second truth that we see. The broken word, his warning, predicted the, sh the scattering sheep. Look there again in Mark 14, verse 26. We'll go down to verse 31. Mark 14, 26. We pick up there again. It says, And when they had, they had uh, sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. 
Peter said to him, Even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Jesus said to him, I, Assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke more vehemently, If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. As we look at the story here, we would say when the heat started turning up, the disciples, they got out of the furnace. A number of years ago, in fact about 10 years ago or more now, I was uh, with a group of students down at student camp. It was uh, the summer camp that all the students looked forward to and the student minister, not so much so. In the heat of the summer, they said, guess what today is? Today is relay day. Woohoo! All right, we get to go out in 100 degree weather and run around like a bunch of crazy folks to try to win a prize like a ribbon or something. Let's do it. Well, I drew the short straw that day because I think I was crab walking back and forth to try to win this you know, mysterious prize. But there was something that, day that happened. You see, the students were all just jumping up and down and excited, but their student minister was off to the side leaning over. See, I had this nauseous feeling that comes up when you run around in the heat like that. I didn't think maybe there was a clear line there that day. The student minister and the students. A line was drawn. You know, when we look at this picture here of the disciples and the response after Jesus was to be arrested and all that would take place, there was a clear line that was drawn. And you'd say, I can't believe those disciples, that they would turn away. But you know what's amazing to me is that as we look to God's Word, we find out not just the broken bread points to His death and His resurrection. In fact, the broken Word even points to that. You see, what we find here in our text is a prophecy from Zechariah. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. You say, why in the world would God include this? I was reading one teacher, one author that was writing on this, and he said, you know, there's a unique thing that happened when the sheep were scattered. They were protected until the resurrection. I thought, that's a pretty neat way to look at it. You see, as they scattered, as they went into hiding, Jesus had another moment where He would meet up with them. And it was after His resurrection when He came and He appeared to them, when He appeared to 500 different folks. And so there was a purpose even in the scattering of His disciples. But you know, I can't imagine the, the pain that Jesus went through knowing this prophecy. Being fully man, but also fully God, I know that He went through all of the pain that we experience and knowing that His inner disciples, His inner group, these would be the very ones that would scatter as soon as the heat turned up a little bit. I was watching yesterday the National High School Championship, and it was a, a game that went into overtime one time, and uh, as it went later into overtime, it looked like it might go into a second overtime, except for that one final shot that was missed. And Finley uh, Prep School, I don't know what the name of the, the school is, Finley won the national championship. You know, it all comes down to who can stand the pressure in that moment. And who can stand it all the way to the end. And so as we see that picture here, we see the disciples, they began to scatter when the, the news came that Jesus would be arrested. But you know, even that broken word, even that pointed to Jesus Christ going to the cross. You know, as I think about it, how many times have we broken our word? Or maybe we've wavered in our commitment to the Lord. We've wavered in a, in a promise that we've made. And as I consider that, I realize that Jesus welcomes us back again and again and again if we come back to Him in repentance and brokenness. Here we see His disciples, they, they scattered out and about and they were fleeing the scene. And I just want to pause there for a moment. As I think about the disciples and the way they fled the scene, it makes me wonder, is God's words, are they true? Are they exactly as He revealed it? Well, if, you know, if the disciples came up with this whole story later, if they thought, you know, this didn't go in exactly as we planned, let's make this sound a little better, don't you think they would have revised the story just a little bit? You see, this didn't paint them too well, did it? These disciples that walked with Jesus all along the way, they were the cowards that were running away. And so, you know, even in details like this, this reminds me, this is absolutely God's Word. Because if it was a made-up story, if it was created after the events, then they would have said, let's make ourselves look a little better. Let's look like we're the stars of the story. Instead, we'd see them looking like cowards, and yet it all was a part of God's plan. You know, excuses are just a part of life, aren't they? All too often they are. I was reading just a few excuses. I hope you've never used any like, like this related to school. It says this, 
This was the letter written. It said, please excuse Marvin from P.E. lessons for a few days. Yesterday, he fell out of a tree and misplaced his hip. Here's another one. It says, I kept Sally home from school because she had to go Christmas shopping with me. I didn't know what size she wore. Or how about this one? Please excuse Jennifer for missing school yesterday. We forgot to get the Sunday paper off of the porch, and when we found it on Monday, we thought it was Sunday. Well, maybe there's some teachers here that could give even better stories than that. You know, as we look at the story here and the story of the disciples, the reason that we can trust that this is God's Word is because there are no excuses here. There's no story to explain their fleeing. It simply is the fear that came over them as individuals that were men and women just like us, that were followers of Christ. And in this moment of decision, we find out that even the broken Word pointed to Jesus Christ going to the cross. But also what I think we find in the story of Mark's Gospel is the broken trust. Our third point, his way paved by the betrayer's barter. Look with me in verse 39. Jesus had come out several times and awakened his disciples, and he comes out once again, and that's where we pick up in the story in verse 39 down to verse 50. Again, he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and scribes and the elders. Now his betrayer had given them a signal saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. As soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid their hands on him and took him. One of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple, teaching, and you did not seize me, but the scripture must be fulfilled. Then they all forsook him and fled. You know, as every aspect of this story points to the fulfillment of the cross of Christ, what we also see here is that even the betrayer's barter, even that pointed to Jesus going to the cross. And as we look at this section here, it says they didn't even know what to answer him. They didn't know what to say. They were only commanded two things. They were to watch and they were to pray. On this past Wednesday evening, we were talking about Nehemiah and how he was faithfully obedient again and again to the call of God. And he gave that call to the people, let us rise up and build. And as we were thinking about the obedience of Nehemiah, we were thinking, what is it that God calls us to as a church? And we summed it up in just a few words, that our entire purpose as a church is that we're to love God and we're to love others. Really, we could sum up everything that we do in those simple words, love God and love others. You know, in the same way Jesus gave a simple command to us, we see here in the story that Jesus gave a very simple command to his disciples, to watch and pray. And yet what we find again and again was while their betrayer was right there at hand, they simply couldn't fulfill even that simple task. You know, as I think about that, I wonder if they were surprised by the time. I wonder if they were surprised that the time had arrived when Jesus was to be betrayed. Maybe you've been surprised by the time at at one point or another. My mom's best friend tells a story of when uh, she laid down on one of those wonderful Sunday afternoon naps. It was one of those deep sleep kind of naps. In fact, when she woke up, I think it was about 7 o'clock when she woke up, but there was only one problem. She didn't know if that was p.m. or a.m. It was at that time of year when it's about the same at that point of the year, and no matter where she looked, she couldn't figure out what time was it. Well, it was p.m. Maybe you've had that good of a nap before. Well, you know, as the disciples were at this point, the word came from Jesus' mouth saying, the time had come, the betrayer was at hand. And as I think about that, I wonder, were they ready for that moment? 
I don't think they were. I don't think they were ready. They were thinking always it was out in the future. It'll come later, and yet here they found themselves in that moment. you think if they knew it, they certainly would have stayed up all night long, all day long, praying to the very last moment, but still, they just didn't know. And yet even this broken trust, even Judas coming in, he pointed to Jesus, the sought-after teacher. You know, there's no doubt that Judas, he's the bad guy in the story. We all know that. We all know that he's the one that very visibly turned against Jesus. But you know, it's also important to see those other words that we see in our text here. It says later in verse 50, they all forsook him and fled. We like to point the finger at the one that did it out in the open that was very vocal in public. Well, he's the one that turned back. And yet I wonder how many times each of us would say, you know what, I silently fled. I silently walked away. I didn't make a big show, and maybe my sin wasn't public, but in my own life, I know in my heart, I've silently walked away too many times. And so before we point all the attention on Judas, we look at those other disciples and say, boy, I think so many times, I'm just like one of those disciples. I'm right there with him all the way to the end, but when the heat turns up, I just kind of silently fade into the background. Folks, I would challenge all of us to say, when we look at this picture of the broken trust, that we would say, Lord, I long to stand with you, not with empty words, but with heartfelt obedience. You know, as we see this, this picture here, the betrayer's border, it led to the Easter story, the fulfillment exactly of God's plan of redemption all the way from creation. You know, as we consider that, I think we see one final point also, is the broken Savior. You know, as I read uh, this point this week in my office, it just broke my heart to think we've made it to this point. When we've been looking forward to how God's Word builds from Genesis all the way up here to the Gospels, and now we've arrived at this point. Amanda was sharing with me on the way to church. She said, I think Easter is more meaningful a holiday to me than Christmas. You know, if we truly do understand all that's built up to this point, when we get to this moment, it's almost too much to bear. It's almost too much to read. Let's look here in Mark's Gospel again. Chapter 15, verse 33. It says, Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by, when they heard that, they said, Look, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink, saying, Let him alone. Let us, let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So that when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that, he cried out like this and breathed his last. He said, truly, this man was the Son of God. As we come to this last point, we see the reality of a broken Savior. And, you know, I think there's several things that help us to recognize just the enormity of the event that took place there in that day. And the first one was this, the heavens recognized this moment. It says in our text here that there was uh, darkness that covered over all of the land. You know, as the darkness rolled in that day. Most scholars would say this is a picture of the victory of sin. The victory of evil in this moment that they had crucified the Savior. The darkness rolled in. Jesus was no more. The story ended. Nature looked at this event and recognized the enormity of what took place. But you know what I think is important is that we realize the Savior recognized this event. He recognized this moment. It says, when he had received sour wine in John 19.30, he said, it is finished. It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. You know what I think is important when we read those words, it is finished. The words are not, I am finished. The words are, it is finished. Well, what was finished? The plan of God from eternity to redeem mankind. It's finished. It's complete. It's accomplished. It's done. In this moment, all of the sins of mankind were laid on the cross of Jesus Christ. He bore them there on that cross, died for each and every one of us so that He could say on that day, It is finished. 
You know, when we think about what can I do to impress God? What can I do that would make God love me enough to grant me eternal life? He says again and again to us, it's finished. It's done. You don't have to do any more. Receive Him. Trust in Him for the forgiveness of your sins and you have life. The Savior recognized in that moment the enormity of what was taking place. But you know, what I also think is amazing here is that the accuser recognized this moment. In verse 39, it says, So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. You know, as you, if you were there that day in the crowd, witnessing all that took place, even the centurion, the one who was there to carry out this death sentence on this rebel named Jesus, when he saw all that took place, he, just like everyone else, the Savior recognized it, nature recognized it, but even his enemy. Even those that would go out to that that place of death and carry out this evil crucifixion, even he recognized it. He said, truly, this was the Son of God. You know, that's all a, a wonderful story up to this point. Unless we ask the next question. And that's this, what do you recognize about this moment? Verse 38 says this, Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. You know, I think that's one of the most powerful verses in this section here because it communicates to each of us. You see, it tells each and every every one of us here that we now have access to God. I don't have to go through a priest. I don't have to go through any other person. I can now come directly to Christ. I can come directly to God. That Christ is that mediator between God and man. And so as He died on the cross, now we have access to Him. And so the question is, what do you recognize about this moment? Well, that's a historical event that took place. That's just something that that some of these folks believe. No, I believe it with all my heart personally that Jesus Christ, when He died, it wasn't just a general event for all of mankind. It was an event especially for those that would trust and believe in Him. Folks, you see His death on the cross, it requires one thing. It requires us to receive Him as our Lord and Savior. Palm Sunday was the event where they said, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. But folks, we realize that the only crown that he ever wore on his head was that crown of thorns. That he would take everything that was brought upon him, pictured in movies like The Passion. Just a vivid image of all that took place in the crucifixion of Christ. Why did he do all that? He was broken and poured out for the love of his creation. Listen to these words on the chorus that I sang just a moment ago. He gave us all. He had to give so that we could truly live. So let's give all we have to Him so that we can be completely free. Do you feel free today? I hope you do because here on the cross we see that it is finished. It's accomplished. There's freedom available to all of us. And so we don't walk around with the heaviness of our sin saying, oh, it's just too much. I can't bear it. No, we say, in Christ I have freedom. I've been set free from the weight of my, my sin. I can cast all my anxiety upon Him because He cares for me. Promise after promise in God's Word made available for one reason. Because Christ was willing to go to the cross for each and every one of us here in this room. The question now is, what does it mean to you? Let's pray. 